Okay, well, welcome back. I'm Kate Cunningham here at the University of New Mexico, continuing our series of guest speakers through Skype in our class this year. Um, I'm here today with Ileana Limon Romero, uh, who is the college sports and soccer editor at the Orlando Sentinel, a longtime Daily Lobo reporter, former sports reporter here, as well as editor in chief. And we're so glad to have her join us today. Uh, to talk to our class uh, in terms of a little bit about what you do there in Orlando, um, sort of your day-to-day -day if you have one, um, and then maybe a little bit about finding sources and doing interviews if we have time. Uh, stay tuned after Ileana talks and we'll have questions coming up from our audience live here. So, uh, Welcome Ileana, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing these days down there in Florida. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Samantha. Thanks for having me. It's great to talk with you all and be able to connect. Um, I love my time in New Mexico. I miss it. And there are so many things about the community that are wonderful that I can't wait to go back to and visit. So thank you for this connection and for reaching out. Um, as you said, my name is Ileana Limon Romero. I'm the assistant sports editor at the Lego Sentinel. I do have the long title of all the different things that I get a chance to supervise. Um, and I've had lots of different opportunities here within the past 10 years. I've been working at the Orlando Sentinel for 10 years, uh, first as a reporter, primarily covering sports, and then moving into an editing role. Uh, to take a step further back, to go way, way back, I'm originally from El Paso, Texas, not far from Albuquerque. Went to the University of New Mexico, and the first person to give me a paid journalism job is your professor. Kate uh, was the first person to hire me when I walked into Today the Lobo. So grateful for the opportunity and the experiences that I had there. It was huge. In addition to the classes and everything else that I had a chance to do, just being out in the community and learning to not be shy, <laughs> learning to engage and really get out there and mix it up. Um, so many invaluable lessons that I use to this day. So everything that you're picking up right now, if you're ever wondering, is this going to help me? Is this useful? Is this worth it? If you stick in this industry, it absolutely is. These are really, really, really useful lessons. What you pick up here will help you. And quite frankly, even if you switch to something else, the ability to communicate clearly, the ability to share information uh, cuts across and makes you stand out. It really sets you apart. So I think everything that you're picking up here is really valuable. I don't know for sure if everyone else can say that in other classes, but I can tell you, you will use what you learn here. So I absolutely have every day. Um, when I was done with school, I went, like I said, worked for David Lobo the entire time that I was in college. That was such a blessing to be able to get all those different opportunities, try different things, sports, news, editing, layout and design, working on a website, doing so many different kinds of storytelling. It was wonderful, even shooting pictures. So. And we didn't do video as much back then, but I do now. So those were all different aspects, uh, skill sets that I picked up. I did an internship at the Austin American Statesman in Austin, which is a really great city to live in, and a really great internship to pursue. I encourage you all, if you ever are looking for summer internships, uh, that's a great one. They pay your housing. So it's a really special opportunity. After that, um, I got a job at the Albuquerque Tribune which was a great newspaper in Albuquerque. It has since closed, but I got a ton of different opportunities to cover different things and learn different uh, types of writing. I started off covering crime and public safety. Really um, tough stuff. Albuquerque's got um, a lot of challenges. I think you all know that from living there, <laughs> that there's different things that come up. Um, I got to do a lot of different projects and got to talk to a lot of different people, do different things on the news side, and then uh, sort of two weeks before UNM was to start football camp, their preseason workouts, the main beat reporter quit. <laughs> and they were looking for someone very quickly to step in. I had covered sports previously in college, had really enjoyed it, and I was kind of looking for a change. I was open to a different opportunity, and I had said, hey, you know, kind of interested in this. It's something I've always been very curious about. I went down the news path because it made the most sense for me at the time, but one interesting thing about this industry is that you don't have to stay in one box. You get to do different things if you want to pursue them. Um, if you're willing to work hard and you're willing to push to really learn, uh, then you can do different things. You can try different things. And so I was able to convince them that they should give me the job, first of all. And then second of all, when I arrived, I realized it is much harder 
to do the job rather than just kind of observe the human passing. It was it was really difficult to come right in right before the season started, but I did. And I learned a lot about how to cover college sports. It's not the traditional path. Most people come in and cover at the high school level and sort of work their way up, get different lessons, learn different things. So I had to compensate for things that I hadn't learned yet, had to work really hard, fail at times, and learn how to adjust, take some really tough advice, and do a ton of research to make up for what I didn't know. But you know, really, really enjoyed it. Um, wasn't really looking immediately to leave Albuquerque, but the paper was put up for sale and closed. So um, I had some friends who worked with the Orlando Sentinel and had made contact with them. And so they had a job opening. It worked out quite well for me. So I was able to move over and cover a wide range of things over here. I did focus on college sports um, in the University of Central Florida, which is the main university here in Orlando before moving into my editing job. So I've had a ton of different experiences and a lot of different opportunities. And those things, it turns out, I just needed all of them. I needed every single thing that I picked up along the way to really help me do my job. Things that I learned while I was covering regents meetings when I was at UNM have helped me so much. Um, you know, we were just talking about you know student code of conduct and how things work in student governance. And in the past five years, that has become extremely relevant in major college athletics because there have been sexual assault charges against or claims against athletes in high profile positions from teams competing for national championships. Um, and if you don't know how the student code of conduct system works, well, then you don't really have an understanding of how the process might happen. And that's something I learned when I was in your seat. That's something that I learned about when I was first teaching the class that you're taking right now. So when I had a reporter who was covering a team playing for the national championship, Jameis Winston was a quarterback for Florida State. He was accused of sexual assault, but not formally charged. No charges were filed against him. The entire process played out behind the scenes through the university code of conduct system. And our reporter was not really sure of how all of that worked. But because I had taken your class and I covered that particular area, I had a good sense of how a state university would handle that. We were able to take those lessons and use those advantages and figure out what to do and how to proceed in coverage. So everything I picked up along the way helped me get to where I'm at. I'm really grateful for all the support that I had at UNM. Really grateful for all the people that I got an opportunity to work with. And it's it's been invaluable. So I hope that you all make the most of your time there. Try to pay attention to the different lessons that you're picking up along the way because I really mean it. They're very, very useful. They're very, very meaningful. Um, so some of the challenges that you all have faced that I heard a little bit about is just um, trying to figure out how to develop sources, trying to figure out how to do some reporting on stories. But one thing I can tell you straight out of the way, um, your challenges are not unique. I work with students out here in Florida, and they face a lot of the same challenges of trying to figure out when they're first going out to work on a story or when they're first assigned to teach in a class. What does that mean? How do you do that? Who do you talk to? Do you have to talk to people? Like, how exactly do you approach all of this? It's it's a little bit challenging, and you're walking into a media landscape that's a little bit more contentious. It is a little bit more difficult. Um, there is an element of not always helping you from the get-go, um, and I think it, also many people that I've crossed paths with who are great journalists can be a little bit shy or don't want to be rude, don't want to intrude, don't want to interrupt, or aren't quite sure of which direction to go. That is something that a lot of us cope with, and we just kind of have to coach ourselves up to be brave, to be bold, to make the phone calls, to break out of beyond just a press release that you're handed, or a group press conference that you go to where you listen the entire time and maybe not ask a question. You have to, in order to get a job in this industry, in order to get paid, uh, in order to get published, you have to work and push yourself a little bit out of that comfort zone. It's not easy. I understand it's hard. I understand it doesn't always come naturally, um, but that's the kind of work that you guys read online. That's the kind of stuff that you're seeing elsewhere. You're seeing things that are much more personal, things that provide much more insight. You're seeing video and pictures and images and other things. That's what wherever you get what you're interested in, whatever you look at in your free time, Think about how that was put together and how you as a storyteller need to get there. What do you need to do to 
achieve that level of interest and engagement? How do you make what you've come across interesting to other people? That's the way we've had to evolve as storytellers every step of the way as technology changes, as the way people get their news changes. And it's not always easy. It is, it is hard. So if you're having a hard time at any point, you're not alone. But you do have to work through it. Take a deep breath. Think about it. Think about how you would get more information. And in that first step is always being willing to make phone calls, being willing to go to places, to go to events, to go to people, to listen, to actively engage. If you're assigned a beat and there are things where you don't necessarily need to write a specific assignment off of that, still go to the event. If you're on a sports beat and, for example, you have a sport that plays multiple times or has practice, but you only need one story that week, if you go multiple times, you will learn more. You will hear more. You will be in a position to eventually ask better questions. Be curious and don't be afraid to ask the questions that you would normally be thinking on your own but maybe not say. Or think about how you would share this information with some of your friends and what you think is the most interesting thing or the most curious thing, the thing that's bothering you the most, or the thing that you think is most relevant. Those are some ways to kind of trigger some better questions that will get you to where you want to be to write a more full developed story. Um, in terms of sources on campus, I mean, from the time that we were in college all the way to now, that's always been hard. It, and it will remain hard because people sometimes are nervous and they want to just share their own story and not go through you. Um, or they just want to only share certain bits of information. And, or they just don't know or not comfortable enough with, with talking with the journalist. And so it is up to you to try to put them at ease, to come with confidence and to explain to them what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do, and you know to be clear and transparent about where you're coming from. Um, I think that being polite looking people in the eyes, shaking hands, trying to go meet with them face to face. While that might seem terrifying or like too much work, um, you know, given everything else you have to worry about in life, um, those are the things that can really distinguish you. Those are the things that can really set you apart and help you very much um, to get to where you want to be. I think being polite is really underrated. I think talking to people directly is really underrated and can help you get stories. Um, if you just Talk with your, your contacts. Let them know what you need. Tell them, you know, this is what I have going on. This is what I'm trying to do. Can you help me or can you point me in a direction of where I could go? Uh, asking for help, ask, asking for guidance can sort of get the ball rolling a little bit. Um, if you're in a more combative situation, if you're in a more advanced reporter who's already uh, trying to pursue some different things where people are not um, as helpful, you just have to continue to pursue what you believe is key information, and then use your resources around you, which includes your professor, but other people that you can get to know in the community who can help you understand public records and what your rights are as a journalist. What you can try to figure out, how you can try to break down, how you can learn to pursue these different stories. I would say that I would never be afraid to ask questions um, of other people within your industry. Other journalists that you come across who are maybe more experienced, or like I said, the people within the department, or people even working at the Daily Logo who've been doing it for a little bit longer. Um, I'm learning lessons every day from other journalists. I go to conferences to learn from other journalists. And while it's a little weird because sometimes we can be competitive on the same story, I also will read their work, look closely at what they do, and reach out and contact them. They will collaborate with me. If there is a journalist in the field that you admire and think, God, he does the job that I want. She does the job that I want. Or how did she get that story? I went to the same meeting and I didn't get anything like that. Most journalists would be amenable if you contacted them to go ahead and talk with you. They would be willing to share that information and that insight with you to explain their process, to explain how they came across it. So, if it's something that you're interested in and something that you're committed to learning about and learning more about, if there are specific instances, there are people like me, your professor, or other people in the community who absolutely would love to walk you through it, who would be perfectly willing to help you out. So I would say take advantage of those resources. And the last thing is a lot of this journalism is tough. It's a tough time right now. I'm sure you've heard that pay is hard to come by, <laughs> that jobs are hard to come by. 
um, at times, but this is really rewarding work. And I still believe that people will always go somewhere to get their news and information. So you can be part of that conversation. You just have to know that it's going to be challenging work. So if it's something that you want to commit to, if it's something that you want to do, you just have to have the work ethic to keep pushing at it, to try to learn more, and an understanding that if you do fall short of what you expected, if you do fall short of what you wanted, to brush yourself off and learn from each one, keep trying and keep moving forward. So kind of a meandering roundabout way of trying to explain a lot of different things, but I think it's a little bit easier if I have a uh, Maybe a few specific questions if you have some instances or things that you all want to discuss or ask questions about. I saw a couple of people on Twitter were interested, so I'm hoping that there's one or two questions. Otherwise, I mean, I can keep rambling for a while, but uh, I'd rather hear from you all. Okay. Great. Thanks for that overview, Ileana. We appreciate that. We're going to have a question coming from the back here um, to kick us off. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is Nash. Um, so I was reading some of your stories and some of them were like, you know, heartfelt stories where you had to get like some, some um, hard, hard to get info from your, from the people that you interviewed, like a mom of the football player. So how do you go about getting like touchy info like that? It's tricky. That particular story that I sent over, that took um, years to really build up relationships that, that would get them to be in a position to talk. But the interesting thing, when I was covering, you know, crime and public safety in Albuquerque, so it's a week I'm covering police stuff. And my first week on the job, there were seven homicides in one week, which is crazy. And so I, you know, I went up to that house. Um, I was assigned to usually follow up and when somebody had passed away, which I think is kind of extreme grief and kind of comparable to what that mom and that story was going through. Um, you know, through public records, you can look up the address. It's also on the police report often. So through various means of information, I was able to find the address of where to go. And so it's not unusual for television and print journalists, digital journalists, radio journalists to go to the home knock on the door or call and see if you can get a comment or reaction about it and sometimes it does not go great and they tell you to get out of my face when they're angry and they're upset and sometimes it goes extraordinarily well where they're willing to just open up and share their story um and you never know which one's gonna be and i distinctly remember there was a teenage boy who was shot in a church in albuquerque by cops and he was armed with a toy gun wasn't even a real gun so I'm outside of this house, this mom's there, she's really, you know, I, I don't know how she's going to react, but it was a really bad situation. And not only that, she's the one, he had some mental health issues, so she's the one who had initially called police to report that he was acting bizarrely, and then it, her call for help ends up with him being killed. So I'm sitting in the car, I legitimately like, did not want to go in, this sounds terrible, this sounds like a bad assignment. This could go fantastically horribly. She could shout me down, or other people in the family could. And I was just like, okay, well, like, it'll just be over, is what's going to happen. Like, I'm just going to take a deep breath, get out of my car, knock on the door, and just say that I'm a reporter, and she want to see if she's willing to share her story. So that's the answer to that question. Are you willing to share your story? Is she willing to talk to me about her son so that I can tell readers about who he was and what his life was like? Um, I consider whenever there's something catastrophic like this happened, a football player's death, other things like that, I just want people to know who they were. And that's what I'm trying to tell them. And I'm, I'm just interested in sharing who they are, who they were, because this is, you know, in some of the lower profile cases, this is the last thing they said about a person. And you have an opportunity to share their memory, to have people know how they want them to be remembered. That often is something that hits home with people. How do you want your son to be remembered? So you'll see high up in that story, I think there was some folks that she wanted him to be remembered in a certain way as saving other people. They pursued the crowd. She wanted him to be known for saving other people who had the same medical people she did. So in that particular case, the mom let me in and talk with me, the one I was talking about in Albuquerque, which was shocking to me, but she was willing to talk. And it was hard for me because she was so emotional and crying throughout the interview. 
But at the same time, like she had these amazing important stories to tell about her son. So I think it's having some really tactful and polite, broad, open-ended questions that you ask people, um, where you just say, you know, I would like to tell your son's story, and I would like the people to know who he is and know more about him. Um, I understand that you're going through a horrible time, and if you don't want to talk, I totally respect that, but just hoping to help people understand what we lost. We lost somebody in our community. Who was he? What did he do? What did he need? So I think that's something that has helped me out a lot, um, mm -hmm. just having those kind of broad, specific questions in mind. I do think about it a lot before I walk in or before I make a phone call. I think more often than not, there's often phone calls. And I would say like 90% of these have gone well. Now, the, the parents in that particular case, I did not talk with them right out of the gate because they were grief stricken and it didn't work out, but I did talk with a lot of other family members who were willing to share those stories. A ton of friends, um, a youth minister, youth coaches, a whole bunch of other people who helped paint a picture of who this kid was. And I think operating with a level of professionalism and being polite, like I said, really helped me down the line eventually get the best interview after the trial was over, um, which was an exclusive interview. So. Can you tell me, like, what you think? Do you have other examples of ones that you thought were particularly tough, or does that answer the question not for you, what I mentioned? Um, in your work or my work? In your work, I mean, I want to make sure this is relevant and this answers the question enough for you. Do you feel like you got enough out of my response? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, okay. I haven't really had any, like, crazy stories crazy yet. Stuff. Yeah. Interviews, yeah. Not yet. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's, it's still... Um, at times, everybody is a little sensitive about being interviewed. Sometimes it's because players are nervous. Sometimes it's because people you're talking to are nervous. They're not accustomed to being interviewed by journalists, which, you know, when you're first starting out, you're like, well, why am I making you nervous? <laughs> like, I'm just doing my first few stories, too. Um, but it's just about, you know, being very clear about your intentions, asking very specific but broad questions, and being polite and respectful of their time. You know, asking, can I talk with you? And, and kind of cutting through as quickly as possible. Not necessarily explaining a ton, but just saying, I'm working on a story about this, and I would love your insight and perspective, and you talk with me for a few minutes. And then the other thing I would tell all of you is, at the get-go from that, they say, yeah, sure, okay, they're willing to talk with you, get their name right out of the gate. Make sure you get their name and make sure they're comfortable with using their name. I and many other young journalists before me, after me, have had many wonderful interviews that have gone on and on and on on the topic. I'm like, at an event, this is amazing. I finally got someone, it's a breakthrough. At the end, they say they don't want their name used. Well, that was a waste of your time. So, just making sure when you have that conversation, it, it, it's going to feel awkward to you at first, too, but anything that you can do to, to ease their discomfort by being really calm and having a specific question in mind and knowing what's going on, uh, it, it helps a lot. It helps ease the start of that conversation. So you, you have to think about what you're going to say. Um, you make it as concise, like I said, as possible. You want to just really be quick about it so they don't have to overthink it and don't get overwhelmed by all the information, all the background of your story. Just, just tell us what you need, ask for it politely, usually work. Duly noted. Thank you. Hi, I'm Taylor. Hi. So Hello. my question's not as um, kind of like that. It's just a little more general. But um, with, do you ever have to cover stories that you particularly are not excited about, don't want to cover, and how do you kind of overcome that hurdle? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's fairly common. A lot of them are challenging at times. I mean, some of them, they call them process stories sometimes when it's on your beat. It's a meaning, it's a thing that doesn't seem as interesting. Um, you know, it's hard, really find, hard to find um, the interesting people who are involved. It's hard, really hard to find the interesting people who um, play a role in it. People to me are more interesting than places and things. So I try to find the people, if that makes any sense at all. Ask people to bring their background, why this is happening, why people should care, why people are passionate about it, why it matters to them. The people involved obviously care something about it. 
and to try to discuss what its impact is. So do you have any specific examples that you can tell me of something like a meeting, a thing that you had or a scientist that you like to um, Well, no, I mean, I haven't, I have other, you know, people who cover like, um, legislator or something that's kind of not always as exciting just sure. kind of how you I guess overcome like being like Ugh, I don't, I don't yeah. want to cover this <laughs> or you know right. something like that right I think some of it is just like you you, you power through some of them because yeah. Yeah, it's part of the bigger process and part of the obligation of informing your audience of how things are progressing um but there can be amazing stories with legislature there can still be amazing things that come together and yeah there are a ton of meetings that are just meetings um that are just blindly boring <laughs> so there's no question about it um i think like i said i think you try to identify either why something is not happening if some legislation is getting stalled why it's stuck why it's not progressing who it impacts um, is a very specific, important thing, and um, the people involved who are passionate about it on either side, you try to bring their energy. Now, they can be very dull in, in their approach to things, but I think if you're able to ask those questions or take a step back and say, okay, who in this community is this affecting, and can I go outside to that group, not even if you're represented at this meeting, and ask them what this means to them, you know, if their funding is getting held up or something, or if they're, they're the ones who are doing these come together um, and I think trying to find the people behind everything and what the impact is and how it matters to people in the community is how I try to work around that then I also accept the challenge that some things are just things some things in sports in news in meetings you just have to say what happens and they're in the parlance of newspapers they call them briefs in radio it's part of the news roundup on tv it's 20 seconds on air but it's it's something that's relevant and it's happening and and we want to be able to give people a very quick roundup of what's happened in their community without boring them so the challenge to you is how do you take it and describe it in as concise a way as possible as few words as possible just make it thing make it as quick in and out detail that you can provide for people so that they can glance at it, see what happens in their community, know where to stand, and move on. So it's taking all the like legal jargon and other stuff out of it and just explaining it like a normal person so that you're like John Oliver at the end of the week on HBO and just going around stuff. Fun, engaging. All right, how do you do that? That's sometimes at the end of the day, you just have to find a way to write it really, really, really punchy and just. Just do it. If there's no extra that you add to it, but you do try to take out the majority of boring stuff, make it very concise and clear, use all your journalism rules to just get right through it. Everybody has to eat your vegetables sometimes. So some days that's what it is. Perfect. Thank you. Just a really quick technical note, because I always tell my students to adjust the microphone if it's making a strange noise during the interview. Um, I think you might be bumping the mic or something yeah. just every once in a while. So, okay. see? Got it. Yeah, All right. Do. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Ajink here, and I tweeted about asking you the questions about Orlando City FC. And okay. um, I wanted to, well, uh, I had a couple of questions, and my first one was, uh, so when you cover soccer games, it's sometimes, um, well, more, yeah, sometimes there's a similar series of events that occur uh, within a game. And mm -hmm. what is your advice on how to not make writing monotonous? So yeah, that definitely can happen in the course of any sporting event, and in particular soccer, you can go through draws, zero, zero, or a lot of repetition of different things. Um, I think it depends on the situation. I think that's where um, there is a tendency in sports in particular where there are a couple of different ways to write an article. You can start from the beginning of the match or toward the end and just write who won, and then go back to the beginning of the match and say, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and just cycle through what happened through all 90 minutes of the game. That, as a reader, is not very enjoyable. So, generally, what we try to do is 
identify what um, decided the outcome of the game. So whether it is as a result of a tie in soccer, a score of a tie, um, or whether you know there were some specifically important defensive plays or turnovers or performances by individual players that helped settle what happened. So we try to describe that in as colorful detail as possible. And that can make it a little bit distinct. And then in the course of post-game interviews, we try to ask questions about why things, how people saw things from their perspective, why there were challenges, or how the game was won, what some key plays were. And so even if there are multiple games in a row where they're starting to play that way, they're starting to end all the same way, well, in that case, we talk about why. Why are they in the same rut, or why is it going forward in that way? I think in that case, interviewing, asking questions, listening to people and putting their perspective in can definitely help avoid it becoming monotonous or tedious or repetitive of what you have over and over again. So sort of depends on the situation. If you don't have the benefit, there are some people who are on extremely tight deadlines or are just trying to write something very quickly for a website and get something up very fast. Um, and in that case, what a lot of reporters do and what I encourage our journalists to do is to contrast what has happened in the past with what happened in this game. And if it's very similar, talk about what the players' motivations were going into the game, what they were hoping to accomplish. Generally, we followed them during the course of the week, and we've done interviews ahead of time, and we've said what their expectations were in the game. And that allows us to contrast what happened versus what they hoped would have happened. And those sorts of insights really help you distinguish, you know, They've gone seven games in a row scoreless, and they were hoping to score. They made all these different changes, and nothing changed. That is a very interesting story, versus just writing that, no, they didn't score, they didn't score, this happened, this happened, this is why. I think the process of trying to break out of those things, the context that you bring from those interviews beforehand and afterward can really help it avoid being monotonous. Okay. And my second question was, um... So since you mentioned that you um, have been also covering uh, these sports and I guess it was, uh, yeah, in for the uh, local colleges. And I wanted to ask you, what are the differences you encounter between reporting on college soccer and in professional soccer? Um, there's, there's the same differences um, just in terms of the, the style of play, level of play, the amount of time that's devoted to the play. Um, the game itself is the same, the goal is the same. So there are a lot of similarities, but differences I think is the comfort level with talking. Um, a lot of the professional athletes are more accustomed to doing interviews and providing insight of what they do. Um, the, the stakes are higher for them, you know, whether their careers are over or continue, their performance is they they often face you know, there, there were athletes at the end of last year who did not return to this year's team who were out of contract or no longer playing soccer because of their performance. There are athletes on a college team, typically it's like, well, it's the next year, and they'll, they'll still continue to be on scholarship. Whether they play or not, it's frustrating or not frustrating. But the stakes can be um, a lot more dire for professional athletes in terms of what they hope to achieve, what they hope to accomplish. So a little bit different in that sense. Um, but there are still many, many similarities, and I, I find um, high school soccer, college soccer, pro soccer, all to be very valuable, especially if you have an aspiration to cover pro soccer at some point. I think covering all levels can give you great insight. Um, the quality of the game, obviously, if they're professionals, you expect a higher quality. Um, there's a certain nicer to watch, but other than that, there's not a, a massive, massive difference. For sure, thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Sanchez and I'm the editor-in-chief at the Lobo currently. <laughs> um, so it's nice to see an alum and see that you're doing really well, that's exciting. Um, so I do have a question that sort of pertains to management and editing. Um, so a lot of times when I receive a sports related article, there will be a line that seems to be on the border of objectivity and opinion because um, statistics support it, yet um, it still sounds opinionated. For example, um, 
so-and-so is the best basketball player UNM has seen. Um, how can I go about um, editing that in a way to showcase the player's talent while also um, supporting objectivity and keeping the objectivity alive? Yeah, I think the main lesson across the board for anybody like that, whether it's sports or other areas, the, the main instruction that we have is to show, not to tell. You don't need to tell me that he's the best. You need to show me how he's the best. You need to show me the statistics and demonstrate to me and have other outside voices. I honestly, you know, a reporter's assessment is not always what I, I that's great, that's what you think, but I need people who either are analysts or experts in the industry, other people in the field to say that, if you want to definitively say that, but otherwise, it's letting your readers draw their own conclusions and giving them the opportunity to take all the information that very clearly demonstrates and makes the case that this person is the best without outright saying that they're the best um, and letting the reader draw their own conclusions. So to me, the instruction is, you need to show me this, not tell me this. You need to show me how statistically they have outperformed. You need to show me statistically how this was the best performance. And, and let those statistics speak for themselves and let the readers make their own conclusions about who's better, who's worse. Um, I, I think you could argue right now that no one on the team <laughs> of any of the UNF teams is the best. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a fair critique. That is a critique that is ongoing, though. That is a critique that I get from some of the people that I supervise, who are professionals in the field, and who, um, when you are covering a group and you get a lot of time with them and you're exposed to them constantly, that is your perspective. You zoom in and you're focused solely on that group. You spend a lot of time with them. You, you really uh, don't get a wider view. You don't see the rest of the country. You don't see the historical insight and so having someone come in as an editor who's not directly involved is valuable and important. Um, so I'm not saying that they can't be the best. I'm not saying that they can't argue that they're the best. They just need to show it to the reader instead of telling them is my best advice. Just demonstrate it and make the case instead of laying it out there and just saying they're the best basketball player or whatever. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I do have another question for you. How can I get sports reporters to not only to well to to stop thinking only in um, like a recap preview um, mindset for games and start thinking more of like news or features about athletes or athletics in general and looking for those news stories that are within sports. Yeah, it's always a challenge. I think um, it's very easy to fall into a routine and to feel like you have to keep up with others who are on that routine. That's part of beat reporting that you'll see from everywhere. You end up following into a rhythm and following the pack. That happens on news, that happens on sports, that happens all over, and you want to stand out. You want to be the best. So what I would try to do is appeal to their sense of, do you want to be the best on your beat? Do you want us to have the best information? Or are we going to have the same thing that they have in the journal and the same thing that you can see on the TV stations or on the logos or anywhere else, any other website, if people put something up, or if I saw the game, like I already know everything that you've already put together. Tell me something I don't know. Show me something that I don't know. That's our goal. That's our goal is to give something new to people. Because otherwise, why are people going to read? Why are people going to come to look at what work we're doing? So I think that encouraging them to be confident, uh, praising them for their instincts and their knowledge of the area, and telling them, you know, we, we've done a good job of keeping up with the games. We've done a good job of previewing the games and being there when everyone else is there. But how can we do more? How can we push ourselves? Who is the most interesting person on the team that you want to know more about? Now, one of the challenges that they're going to have is that there's limitations to who they have access to. There are major access limitations to the bigger, the higher profile is for You know, basketball and you know football, it's hard. They're going to tell them no more often than yes about getting individual or one-on-one -on -one interviews. But there are still opportunities to do more than that. And you look at somebody like Jeff Brown at the Journal, who obviously pushes very hard and distinguish himself and find unique stories and different ways to move everything forward. They have access to different information. They can reach out to high school coaches who coach these players before they got to UNM 
and talk with them about how they develop. Often these athletes stay in touch with their high school coaches and they have a close bond. Can figure out who else they're friends with on the team and sort of get a sense of that interaction. And sometimes you end up asking it in a group setting, but you have to ask them slightly different questions. This is intimidating when they tell you, you have five minutes, it's a whole group, the TV guys are talking, person from the journal is talking, and there's hardly any time, but you have to really think about what you want to accomplish and use your one or two questions in a meaningful way to bring something different to the table. So um, I think just trying to find outside resources outside of the traditional press conference can help you out a lot. In terms of news stories, there are records requests. There are a couple of other things that you can do that can really move you forward. I think it never hurts to have your um, whoever is covering you and MTV to be aware of who's on the teams or have some level of interaction because inevitably somebody gets in trouble um, and there's news there. Uh, outside of that, you know, I, I think it's a little bit uh, takes a little bit more time, and I can send you a much longer email probably about trying to come up with some different ways for stories or projects and take a closer look at what the world has done so far uh, to, to sort of understand what else you all could be tapping into for other resources. Um, but I think also talking with them about work that they admire. What do they read in their spare time? What do they like? Is there anything that they're looking at? Are they watching videos that they're watching or people that they're watching, people they follow on Twitter or elsewhere who they think do really good work? How they can emulate that how they bring that to their job, you know, that's that's understanding what it takes to put that information out there, how to gather that information. Um, and I think a lot of times for student journalists, it may not seem like it's you because they may give you a hard time at times, but it's usually a confidence problem. And it's usually a confidence of being willing to break out of that path. And so you saying that you support the work that they're doing, that you think that they've done a good job, reaching this level of game stories, recaps, doing different things, keeping people up to date with what's going on, and now you want to take it a step further. You want to be a little bit um, distinct. You want them to really show off all their skills and show off even more. Um, that can be helpful. So that, I think, like I said, it's it's a little bit intimidating. The, the pack is big, and it's hard to, to do something different. All right. Well, thank you so much. And it's true. I am super proud of all the work that they've done, but this will be helpful for moving ahead and expanding on what things we cover. So thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Courtney. Hi. Um, so this is kind of like a fun question, but like, what's your favorite thing about being a sports writer? Hmm, favorite thing. I think it's the same thing that's my favorite thing about being a journalist, which is the opportunity to talk to people and tell their stories. I really like being able to do an interesting interview. If I have a very stressful day or a lot of other things going on in my life, I find that if I'm able to go out and still do an interview and talk with a person and understand where they're coming from and why they do what they do, so I can ask them a couple of questions and get some unique insight into who they are and how things are going for them. I feel like I can share that with my audience and give them something different they didn't know. And that's always exciting to me. I feel like it's exciting that I learned something new. It's exciting that I get to do something different every single day. And the people are just a really important part of that, being able to tell unique stories. And then um, I just have one more. Um, so, like, what inspired you to transition from crime to sports? Uh, a couple of things. I mean, I, I think it was it was hard what I was covering. It was it was a big challenge. I had done several years of it. I had done a project on meth labs before Breaking Bad. I had done <laughs> a whole bunch of. Um, Gosh, by the time I finished, it was like more than 200 homicides that I covered. So there's just a lot of dead people. <laughs> and there was a lot of other things that were that were just tough. It was, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of push. And just this golden opportunity happened to open up. And I think a lot of things that happened in my career were just something opened up, and I was open to the possibility of doing something different. 
Um, and one of the things that I found within journalism is I really like a lot of different aspects of this industry. So I can find things that are interesting in all different corners of what I've done. It's something that I got a chance to sample while I was at college. I got to do a bunch of different things and realized I liked a lot of different things. So I just try to keep myself open when something happens, when an opportunity arises. I just try to be open to that possibility. And I happen to work in a newsroom right now that has more of a why not mentality. Instead of well, why and telling myself all the negatives, which there are always so many of them, I try to think of why not. Why shouldn't I do it? Why shouldn't I try? Why shouldn't I jump? And, you know, I, I had some wonderful mentors who were encouraging and said, it's not the end of, if you want to go back to you, you can go back to you. It's not the end of the world. It's just give it a shot. See if you like it. If you hate it, you can change. But will you regret not trying if you don't try? And the answer was uncertainly. Yes, I would regret not trying it. And then once I tried it, I had to work really hard at it. It was really challenging. And then I got better at it. And then it ended up having this huge intersection with a lot of new stuff and a lot of other things that I had left behind, sort of, but now it was all coming back and being used and coming into play. So I had this great mix of opportunities that were still interesting to me, that were still, you know, giving me lots of different opportunities to do different things. So that's how I made that jump. I just did. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Hi, my name is Brooklyn. Um, I'm also super interested in becoming a sports reporter. That's kind of where I want to do with my career. Um, I was wondering what challenges you faced working in kind of an, a male dominant field. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely um, different. There are different challenges. Sometimes it's different in the way that athletes will respond to you or coaches will respond to you. There are different challenges for sure. Um, I've been very fortunate. I started off at UNM with a former coach, Rocky Long, who holds the football team. She's the beat reporter for the Albuquerque Tribune. You treat her just like anybody else. If you don't, we've got a problem. That was a great foundation to start with. I was really, 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 really lucky. And most of the teams that I've covered have fallen along those paths, which is not to say that athletes don't react and respond and do their own thing because people are people and some people are nice and some people are not nice. Um, I think the level of professionalism that you carry yourself with is what can help uh, cut through everything. If you operate as a professional, work hard, do your job, to always uh, stand by your work and show your work, um, eventually I think you can put yourself in a position where you're always able to win people over. And if something truly overt or terrible is happening, there are resources available to help you deal with those things. If people are not uh, responding or behaving in a professionally appropriate way or if you're being hazed in any way whatsoever through online uh, social media, people just not responding well, there are lots of resources available to help deal with that sort of thing. So it's not something that you have to operate on alone. There's a group called the Association for Women in Sports Media. I happen to be a vice president on their board, but at the same time it's a national group, so it's not just because I'm a member, but um, I definitely encourage students to look into it. It's definitely a great group of mentors and allies in the sports industry who can help you, who have been through those different experiences. You can provide mentoring opportunities and can show you sort of how to handle those different kinds of things when they come up, um, and also can sort of help point you to different experiences and just different career building opportunities. Um, I don't think there's anything that anyone in that group hasn't been through that you might run into. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot there and a lot of um, support for people now that probably wasn't there nearly as much like 30 years ago when it was even more restrictive. But that's not to say that there aren't challenges. And I, I think um, it does take a certain personality type in journalism in general, but also for a woman in sports media or for any minority coming through. You just have to decide that you want it, that you're willing to work hard and that you want to push through and that you want to just fight to do this job that you think that you can do well, that you want to keep learning, that you want to keep growing. And one of the things I touched on was professionalism. Um, I think I should probably mention to all the students 
Um, in addition to, I'm sure lots of people have told you social media is always open and that people will always figure out if you're posting something that is not professional or that speaks ill of the team that you're covering or the group that you're covering, so that is going to be a challenge for you as a journalist, but that will come back, that nothing is really private. No snaps are public or private, really. They may disappear quickly, but people can screen grab them. There's just lots of things you should know. But one of the other things that I think people sometimes forget about is that when people talk in press rooms, when people talk in press boxes, when people talk in other areas, they tend to unwind and you'll hear a lot of professionals kind of blowing off steam and saying terrible things about different groups. You don't know who's walking by. You don't know who's going to overhear you. On top of that, you guys are on campus. You don't know when somebody affiliated with who you want to cover is going to walk by. You do not want something you said inadvertently in passing to hinder your ability to do your job as a journalist. So is that no fun? Kind of. But it's part of being a professional and it's part of knowing your environment and knowing that in this day and age, people talk. People record things, people share things, and that when I say being professional, like you're all in in this, you're held accountable for everything that you do. So I think that's that's the other thing, and I think in particular women minorities are held sometimes in even higher standard. So everything that you do that you carry yourself, like put your best self out there in every aspect of what you do, and that will put you on a great track to succeed regardless of gender or ethnic background. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Hannah. Hi. Um, so I have a question for you in regards to what are some of the like go-to tools or things that you keep handy when you're attending the event that you're going to cover? Ooh, like in terms of resources, like are you talking about like equipment or are you talking about like things to keep in mind while I'm at an event? Both. Okay, yes, my toolbox, virtual and real. Okay, so real toolbox, uh, chargers uh, for all my devices. You cannot forget your chargers or your deck. Um, so laptop, charger, um, sometimes depending if I don't know where I'm going, if I'm going to a meeting or anything else, take a power strip or it's like a small one. Um, I have had a, like a Mopi, like an e-charger where I can charge devices just using the USB port. Electricity is like everything. <laughs> um, I have a hotspot on my phone. So if I can just keep my phone charged, I can still connect to a wireless network and file to anywhere. I mean, I can make my phone a wireless network and file to anywhere using my computer. So those things are really important. I make sure that I have an old-fashioned notebook and pen. Um, and if I'm going to be out in the elements, I'll sometimes take a pencil because if it's raining or wet or anything else, a pencil will work, a pen will not. Um, I keep in mind what the weather is like. I've had some people on assignment in really cold places where their iPhones shut off because it was too cold, or in Florida where it gets really hot, sometimes in Mexico too. If you're under the sun, it will also malfunction because it's too hot. So I try to make sure that I'm mindful of the elements and keeping like, I'm not gonna stick my phone out and be like, you know, keeping it in high heat every second if I know that I have to find a way to protect it in between. Um, I make sure that I take, you know, clothes that are appropriate, dressing layers, um, so that I can put stuff on, take stuff off. If I don't know how long I'm going to be gone, there's like granola bars and other food that I take. I know it sounds like really <laughs> expensive, like self-care, but <laughs> I've had reporters like go or I'm gone, didn't eat breakfast, raced out the door, went to something, didn't get lunch, like dying around dinner time and like have not eaten anything. And that's not healthy for getting your work done. So having stuff around that you can eat to balance and, and to just pace yourself, take care of yourself. Um, for news reporters, there's often like completely separate, separate like go back to people who are covering like crime, public safety, outdoor stuff. Like you're going to need stuff for weather, you're going to need you know, sunscreen and a hat and other things that are going to be relevant. It kind of depends on where you're going. But whatever you would do to make it comfortable, whatever your mother would shout at the door to make sure you had, like you should have those things in addition to all your basic journalism tools. I haven't very often had the nightmare situation where a device has failed to record something in an interview, but you try to have the backup plan. You try to have and check your recordings in between to make sure that they're still functioning. 
make sure that things are still working, that you still have everything that you need. And then in addition to that, I still take some notes by hand, which is weird to some people, I know, but um, it's a good backup. And what if the recorder failed or what if my video fails? You know, you got to figure out how to juggle these different things. I know a lot of people who will shoot video on their phones and still have a digital recorder, a secondary recording device. I know people who think that's crazy and that's too much to carry. So you have to kind of make some choices, but uh, being prepared is the most important thing, I think. Um, in terms of physically, mentally, um, I've done research in advance. Whatever I'm going to, I know where I'm going. I have like directions, literally a map and directions and understand where I'm going. Um, I also know about the event that I'm going to. I've researched as much as possible online in advance. And if it's a sporting event, you know, I've often done interviews leading up to it, but you can still, you, you do a lot of free research on hand so that you understand. You're able to ask thoughtful questions, not ones that are ill-informed um, or ones that might be annoying to the person that you're talking to because you didn't bother to learn anything about them or what they do before you went. Um, and I try to think of uh, what I'm hoping to get out of it. You know, if I know that I'm going to an event and trying to tell a story, what questions do I for sure need to get asked, or what am I trying to get accomplished that would be interesting to that person? Particularly if I have one of these that we talked about before that can be kind of boring. Um, how do I ask some questions that makes it not boring? How do I figure out who it impacts or who's passionate about it so that I figure out how to tell a better story? So those are some of the things that I go through in advance. Definitely think of some questions to ask ahead of time. Doesn't have to be a full script. I think scripting interviews is not necessarily great either. Going down a list of like, these are my 10 questions. Um, you want to have a conversation with someone if you can. You want to make them as comfortable as possible, be as comfortable as possible you on your end. And if you have to fake it, try to fake it. If you're really nervous, just try to start with one of those two, one or two of the prepared questions where if you get one of those opportunities to have a longer interview, just try to talk with someone like a normal person. I try to have a conversation because a lot of stuff will come out as a result of it. And um, last thing at an event, uh, when I was covering sports, they sometimes turn on scoreboards earlier than you think you're going to. So if you're at a college or pro event, for the most part, you get a, a score handed to you at the end, the press box and their stuff online. But if you're covering high school, it's like they turn off the scoreboard, they didn't even, you don't remember the score, like I write it down at the end. <laughs> Because I've been known to go and get interviews and do a whole thing. And then like I completely forget the score almost instantaneously after any event I cover. I don't know why, but I know it's my problem. So I write it down. And I have it like big so that I don't have to stress. It's like, yes, that was the score. Okay. So it's it's knowing what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and being prepared to work around them. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, so it's me again, and this time it's more of a question that's absolutely not related to the class. Uh, it's a question about Orlando City FC. And so last season they acquired Dom Dwyer towards the end of the season, and he kind of performed well, uh, had four assists, four goals. And I wanted to know this season, um, what, which is, uh, who is going to be their star player, as in their designated player, because Dom Dwyer is one of them. And um, I don't know if they've acquired anyone right now or if there's something going on behind the scenes. And last mm -hmm. time they were not able to quite accomplish what they wanted to in the season. Oh, yeah. So anything in the lead up that you know going on in your newsroom that could just, yeah, be insightful. Sure, sure. Um, they completely changed over the roster more than any other team in Major League Soccer. So there have been a lot of new faces and a lot of new players who are expected to play those roles. But I think most important to the coach and to the team and to their success, they are not looking for one person in particular to be in that star role. They do have other designated players. Patrick Fletchton, uh, who they acquired through the New York Red Bulls, is going to be one of those. And Yoshimura Yakun, who plays for the, um, is also another designated player. He's not as well known here yet, but he is definitely has potential to be extremely well known. But most important to the coaches. They didn't play with a lot of energy or a lot of teamwork last year. They didn't run to the ball. They didn't move with passion and aggression. So to him, having everybody being aggressive, playing aggressively, running, 
effort, and it sounds silly, the soccer coach says, you need to run to the ball, but you um, need to run in general. He likes guys who run. It's like, what? That's basic. So we had to cut that down and really explain to readers sort of what that meant. And what it was was a comparison. Was last year's team had no effort, so he's looking for effort from every single player that he's brought in. And those who were brought in were asked uh, to commit to fighting every play, every second of the training sessions and during the games uh, because they have not reached the playoffs in the history of the franchise, and so that's what their aspiration is. So those are all things that, um, during the course of our interviews, we've been able to assess and been able to share that it's, um, it's a different expectation the coach has brought in and not necessarily as focused on the star players, which for them has been beneficial because a lot of those players have been injured or held out for suspension the first part of the year. So they need that balance and that level of effort off the board. So, any questions? There you yeah, go. Thank you. Okay, well, it looks like we got a little bit of inside baseball there too, as it were, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I know you probably have a deadline or two to meet. Um, our class is about to end. But thank you so much for all the variety of questions that you answered today. We really appreciate your time. And maybe we'll have you back to our class another day. Sure. One last thing. Please. You all, uh, I believe, have my Twitter handle and my email address. I think Kate can share with you all. So if anybody has any questions, don't have to take the email. I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Great. Thanks again, Elian. I really appreciate your time mm -hmm. today. All right. Okay. Thanks. You take care.